Um, when you uh, first met Woody Allen, did you begin by, by writing material for him? Is that, is that yeah, how it happened? Yeah, club act at that time. And um, uh, his, one of his two managers, who has uh, since gone on to produce films, Charlie Joffe, thought that the two of us would uh, get on and maybe work together well. And we did, so we wrote a little bit of his club act and uh, some specials and so on and so forth. It was very formal at first. Uh, it was like um, Gilbert and Sullivan, I guess. Uh, no small talk. I would uh, we'd meet and we'd say hello, hello, and no. Did you see this movie? Did you? The, you know, it was just um, right into work, and then we'd break at a certain time for lunch, and then go back and work. And there was, it was, almost years before we <laughs> had any kind of a. Really? Uh, mm -hmm. We were both very formal. I don't know. This is not. Are you a difficult person to get to know, or is no. he a difficult person? No, I to guess get to he. Know. Well, we. Well, I guess. Well, I guess so. You know. <laughs> Not really, not anymore. But it must have been to a fruitful uh, uh, relationship. relationship. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, and 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 uh, as a result of writing material for Woody Allen, you became one of uh, you became the head writer on the Johnny Carson show. Not no, not on the basis of that. Just that was just on the basis of a couple of monologues that I submitted to uh, to Carson, and um, I, I was hired as a fledgling writer. I was very young. I was about twenty four or twenty five or something, and um, they were still coming out of NBC Thirty Rock here, and. Um, before the whole show moved to California. And uh, I was hired, and then about three months later, the head writer had a big fight and left, and nobody wanted to be the head writer, so I became the head writer. <laughs> and I inherited his files. That's his, that was his legacy to me, which is just cartons and cartons of old routines and jokes. And I sort of lived off them for a couple of months until I got my bearings. Did you create any of uh, Carson's more uh, better known uh, characters or, or skits? No better known characters. I did a lot of writing. I, I still have my files somewhere in, a, in storage and every once in a while I look at them. It's amazing how much stuff you can write if you really have to. I don't know, I couldn't do that today. I would be too fatigued. You, you know, it was an hour and a half show. We didn't write an hour and a half, but I, mm -hmm. we wrote monologues and ske sketches and, and, and reading pieces and all kinds of junk stuff, mm -hmm. things. Are you one of those uh, those those people who who is presently doing something that has absolutely nothing to do with with what he studied in college? I didn't study anything in college. I stu I studied the remaining in college. I started out as a, a physics major, really? and yes, and then at Wisconsin, and then I switched like in the first twenty minutes to chemistry for some reason that I don't remember, and probably having to do with the better girls in the chemistry <laughs> class. No, really, that's you know you know what, how you make decisions. English classes and, and biology. Yeah, right. And, um, and then I switched from that to the all-purpose, non-specific major, which is pre-med, which allows you to take a general Bachelor of Science, I think, without any commitment up until the last semester. You just take anything you want, right? History of arithmetic and <laughs> sketching and, you know, Where music you appreciation. Wisconsin, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. When did you first get the idea for Sleeper? Um, this is a film that you co-wrote with Woody Allen. Uh, Sleeper I wrote with a friend of mine named Tom Baum, who, who uh, wrote Carney, as a matter of fact, and some other things. He's out in California, now lost to us forever. <laughs> but um, we were sitting around thinking of ideas for movies, which is some, something that you do when you have no social life. And uh, w somebody said um, the Messiah scenario. Somebody said that phrase. I think it was me. The Messiah scenario. What would... And then we sort of improvised uh, the idea. What would happen if Herman Kahn or the Hudson Institute or one of those think tanks wanted to uh, see what would happen if Christ came back, they would fake it, you know, because mm -hmm. that's what they're always doing in order to remain in power, in order so the government can remain in power. That's what all those think tanks are about, really, not about peer research, but how to maintain power in the event of any untoward incident. And uh, from that, we derived the, the story for, for the movie. Uh, did you approach Woody Allen with the material, or was he in on the actual writing of the script? Who? Uh, did, did you say Sleeper? Sleeper? Oh, Sleeper! I thought you said Simon. Ah, oh, you'll have no. to edit this all out. Okay. Oh, for Sleeper? Sleeper, yes. Oh, Sleeper. No, we were just sitting around. Um, oh, so that's all strike all right. of that. We, um, we, meaning Woody and I, uh, we, we said, uh, let's write a movie, and uh, then we agreed, yes, let's... And then someone said the Messiah scenario. No, then, no, then, <laughs> then... We, we, I don't know. We, we, we usually, when we worked together, if memory serves, it's been a while now, we usually had about three ideas that would sort of vie for prominence. And on Monday and Wednesday, the idea of the futuristic movie seemed good. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, the idea of the, the movie that took place in the 12th century seemed good. And then on you know, Saturday, something else, the boxing movie, whatever it would be. And um, 
what happened? I think Woody wanted to do a movie. He had an idea about doing a movie about a society where nobody was allowed to speak. Oh, you know how it, how it, how it evolved? Now I remember. We wanted to do a movie with no dialogue, which is, I think, the, the, the fondest hope of every comedy writer, because then it doesn't seem like work. And um, we thought of what way, what's a good way to rationalize or justify a story in which people don't speak. If they're contemporary people, it doesn't seem right, because people speak. And um, not to do simply a, a modern version of a silent film from the silent comedy days. We thought, what about in the future, maybe there's a society in which only privileged people can speak, that speaking is a privilege, you know, like having an American Express card or taking the Concord or something. And um, we thought about that for a while until we realized that it's very limiting because many of the, if you're doing a satire, many of the ideas are most quickly and easily expressed in dialogue rather than in movement. Yeah. So we abandoned that, but we were in the future. <laughs> so we stayed there, and we did a satire. Sleeper came to be. Now, um, after Sleeper, you, you again collaborated with Woody Allen on Annie Hall. Is, is that the right sequence? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a sequence that happened. I don't know if it was the right one. Based on what you've had to say about your friend Tom Baum, who's moved to California and is now lost to you all, I suspect that you had a lot to do with the parody of California in Annie Hall. No. I mean, as much as Woody. Uh, it just seemed like uh, a... You know, people sometimes, people, I mean, it's easy, I suppose, to, to associate the attitudes and the, and the attitudes of the characters with things that are deeply felt, you know, by the authors. But in, in, a, in a comedy, what you look for, or in a satire, you look for conflict and you look for targets. And so I, I have no great loathing of California. Um, but you wouldn't want to live there. I don't need to live there. Uh, I have all my, f I have my stuff here in New York, so it seems silly to go to California. I just have to take my stuff there. So I might as well just leave it here and stay next to it. You know, all my books and my, my things. After, after you, you co-wrote uh, uh, Manhattan, uh, did you make a conscious decision to become a director on your own and to more or less cut off the, uh, the Woody Allen connection? It seemed like a, a logical and natural development. Uh, I wanted to see what it would be like to direct my own things, and I realized that, that Woody and I were probably fairly close to the end of that particular type of collaboration in which I, I felt we had explored just about to exhaustion whatever uh, feelings we had concurrently about certain subjects or attitudes about living in the city, about a certain type of overeducated, slightly neurotic, self-aware person, um, and so on. And I felt that, the, that there were things that I wanted to do and say that were distinct and different from the things that he wanted to say. Uh, so it seemed like a logical progression for me. Did, did, did winning the Academy Award for uh, uh, the screenplay of Annie Hall uh, help you to make this, this move? It helped me to get the film launched, but I think the move was made, the, the, the impulse was, was before the, the Annie Hall was really released. I remember your, your acceptance speech. You thanked Woody Allen for being in Manhattan that night. <laughs> I, there's one thing I, I was going to say, and then uh, propriety got the better of me. I wanted to thank the Academy for giving the award to a foreign film. <laughs> I thought it would have been a good laugh, but but a hostile joke. Is is there hostility between the uh, the Academy and the the, the more or less Hollywood uh, establishment and New York filmmakers? I'm unaware of it. Unaware of it. <laughs> you just mentioned uh, one person. <laughs> right. uh, well, I, I, no, I don't get hate mail or, or you know I don't. Since, since since Ralph Rosenblum wrote his uh, his book and, and and suggested that he had much more to do with the final cut of Annie Hall than anyone previously knew, uh, there's been further speculation that, that you may have provided uh, the backbone for those scripts, uh, for, the, for the scripts of Sleeper, Annie Hall, and Manhattan. Is there any, uh, any truth to any of that speculation? I can only quote, not really, not in, I don't think in what you're getting at, no. Yes. Uh, I can only s tell you what, what Woody once said to me, uh, which I think is the, the, the wisest and fairest evaluation of, of a collaboration. He said, when two, whenever two people get into a room to talk about stuff, they're both responsible for everything. And while you can pick apart a work process, and if you were to tape record two months of conversations, you might com put it on a computer and find out that all of the, the, the structural ideas came from person A and all of the whatever, you know, the satire or something came from person B, it still wouldn't be useful in assigning who's responsible for what, because if you and I have a conversation, 
you know what I'm getting at, obviously. Yeah, what, synergy, yeah. Yes, what you, you say makes me think of something that I wouldn't. The two people become an entity, and I think that that's very true, and, and the simplest and most correct way of looking at it. So uh, I don't know what Ralph was implying. I mean, he's, he's an editor, one of the best editors extant, certainly, but he was working with material that he got. Uh, and nobody makes a film by himself, really, nobody, in spite but, of possessory credits. Nobody makes a film by himself. There was the Woody Allen Marshall breaking connection and the auteur theory, all in uh, 20 seconds. 20 seconds? Right. The auteur theory is a theory of critics, not of filmmaking. Critics who became filmmakers, at no, least. Theory <laughs> by critics of filmmaking. It's not a. It's not okay. a well. it, 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 is, is Lovesick a, a send up of psychoanalysis? No. It isn't. Not a send up of it. No, no it treats it with the respect. Uh -huh. uh, but But is critical of it. It's not a send-up in the sense that there are a lot of zanies running around, uh, you know, cl climbing up the window ledges and so, so sw swallowing stelazine. What is your view of the subject of psychoanalysis? Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about it? Well, it, you, you put, I'd prefer you to see the film. I'd rather not... not um, I think it's a... Obviously, Freud is one of the three great influences on our culture. I don't know who the other two are, perhaps. No, Einstein Marcy and Darwin, Darwin Marx, or one of the four, anyway, you know, whatever course you took. So, certainly someone to be reckoned with, but um, I think it would be uh, fatuous of me, if that's the word I want, probably isn't, to, to say here what I would want to say in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, um, do you know, do you know uh, uh, Pynchon's novel, The Crying of Lot 49? I could never get through more than the first half of the first word. So, so, so Dudley Moore's character is not a kind of Dr. Hilarious who barricades his office and keeps the National Guard off with an AK-47? Oh, no, it's not that kind of film. No, no. Uh, it sounds funny, but it's, it's not that broad a film. It's a more of a... The characters are much more believable and, and uh, their problems are, are more understandable. And it's not an, a, a hyperbolic examination of... Well, what is your own experience or the experience of your friends or the experience of people you know been with analysis? I don't know. Uh, maybe that's why I did the film. I was in uh, what I suppose you'd call classical mm -hmm. psychoanalysis. I mean, I lay, came in, I lay down on the couch, nobody spoke, I left, you know, that kind of thing. A lot of money exchanged hands in one direction. And um, we had a joke in, uh, in Sleeper about, um, where they're talking about psychoanalysis, it just reminded me of, he said um, one of the characters studying the, the culture of the 1960s or 80s or whatever, he said, what was the psychoanalysis? And somebody said, uh, I guess it was Woody, said it was, uh, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow it. He said uh, it, was a, it was a kind of medical treatment in which uh, he was supposed to be helped by paying large amounts of money to a man who pretended to be listening. <laughs> something that's a little cumbersome, but it was something like that. Um, my own view of it is that I guess it helped. I don't know whether life wouldn't have given me the same insight. Probably not. It's a, it's a useful stabilizing influence during the time that you're in it. Um, I'm being a little bit harsher on it, perhaps, than I should be. Well, there's no doubt that it is a major factor in, in modern life, and uh, especially modern urban life. And uh, I assume that you will, by necessity, be stepping on somebody's toes. I hope so. <laughs> Who's not toes? why I do the movie. <laughs> Who's toes? Well, uh, it's just a particular view of... You know what the movie is about? The movie is not a satire in that it attacks a convention, a social convention. What it is is the story of someone who's caught in a particular lifestyle and who has an enormous amount invested in this lifestyle, which involves and includes and, in fact, is the practice of psychiatry and a desire to help people and the fear... And, and, the, and, the, and the suspicion that he's not helping people the way he wants to, but, but he, you know, he's, he's in it. He doesn't know what to do. And what happens is, is this particular person, so that the character that Dudley plays is, is not a stereotype, but I hope he's a, an individual who finds himself in this situation. And that's the difference. It's not, the movie is not about psychiatry. It's about this guy and how a human being responds to a lot of these different pressures. But, but certainly it's going to present uh, film-going audiences with, with, with a different vision of, of, of psychiatry. It's going to tear the lid off the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. Exactly, okay. Because previously we've, we've gotten the reverential... Yeah, or, 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 they, or they won't give a shit, I don't know. <laughs>
reverential, we've gotten reverential treatments in films like An Unmarried Woman and in Bergman's Face to Face, whatever, and yeah. uh, I'm dancing as fast as I can. And certainly lovesick sounds as if it might put a fire under them. Uh, yeah, it has certain things. Freud Freud says certain things in the movie that I think he would say now if he were alive. You know, if he were alive, he wouldn't be doing analysis now. Freud. What would he be doing? Well, he'd be doing something much more on the leading edge of, of uh, experimentation, right? Because back then, psychiatry or psychoanalysis was the equivalent of, of uh, I don't know, something that maybe come out of out of altered states. I mean, it, right? Like being a medium, in a sense. It was great. something. Yeah. The point. You tread that thin line between what was scientific and what was supernatural. So I, I, in a sense, have Freud's what he, what his opinion, what his take on contemporary American psychoanalysis might be. Were he alive to see it? I wonder if the New School is going to strike your name from its mailing list. Yeah. The New School? Why? <laughs> I'm not on their mailing list. Oh. <laughs> well, so in punishment, they'll put me on it. Is that what you're saying? Perhaps. Well, um, will you will you be writing scripts for other directors, or are you? Do you plan to? to work exclusively as a film director on your own from now on? I've, th I've had thoughts of being a handyman. This is not, this is not I'm not being facetious. This, you know, when, when we stopped filming, there were a lot of things that accumulated in the house that you can either pay somebody $600 to come in and fix, like rewire the lamp, mm -hmm. or do yourself. I find it enormously gratifying to do small jobs of limited uh, intellectual effort with a definite end to the schedule, like you take an hour and then you have to, then the lamp works. Does this, am I getting through? Oh, yes, it makes very good sense. Now, in answer to the first part of the question, uh, no, not for other directors, unless Kurosawa came to me and said, you are the only person to write this script, then I would, then I would do it, and a couple of other directors, obviously, though. Woody Allen, perhaps? Uh, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, I, it, 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 it processes everything, right? Mike Nichols said that. It's just the process is, is everything. The, the, the time that you spend doing the work is, is more important than the result. I guess I'm on very thin ice here, aesthetically and philosophically, but I think it's something to keep in mind. And if the people that I get to work with are, are fun and will stretch me and, and, and it will be a gratifying experience, of course I'll do it. Because I think you know, there are people that you can learn from. You wrapped, you wrapped uh, Lovesick two weeks ago. Do you have another project in the works? Yeah, in the works. I mean, I have a script. In mine. Yes, I, <laughs> it's not like I'm being interrogated. Um, I have this script on, on my desk, uh, and I'm looking at it sort of skeptically. You know, I have another idea, a film that I think I want to do. It's a little hard to make a commitment right now. A lot of people say, gee, I better get the other project going before <laughs> they find me out, you know? <laughs> um, I've never had that. I've been mo more fatalistic about, about uh, my career. And, uh, but I do have another film. It's a film about Hollywood, actually, that I that I'd like to do. Yet another film about Hollywood, but with a different idea uh, to it, a comedy. Uh, and I'd like to start filming about April, I think. So no chance that you'll be coming back to med school. <laughs> Not as a doctor, maybe as a patient. Um, no, I um, I like about one film a year. Mm -hmm. Is good. I think. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs>